All right. <clears throat> I'd like to start off by saying Barakat Yahweh. Bahashem Yahweh Shai, Bahashem Racha Kodash. Welcome to another live lesson. The name of this one is uh, Revelation chapter 20. And this uh, video is inspired by a comment uh, that Elder Pastor made. I believe that was the last video he did. Um, can't remember the name, Salaka. So many videos that go up, you kind of forget the names of these videos. But I believe it was the very last video he put up. And he mentioned that someone should do a breakdown on Revelation chapter 20. Uh, so I thought that was, you know, a good idea because I didn't have anything, you know, on the burner, so to speak. And I was, you know, searching uh, for something to go into uh, Lord's will to be to edify and um, Lord's will to be an edifying lesson. Now, before we begin, I would like to say that there are certain scriptures in the Bible that are difficult to understand sometimes because when people read the Bible, they try to read it like a fable. They try to read it like a book, you know, that you pick up and you read from the beginning to the end. And they try to understand it that way. They figure they start at page one and go all the way to the last page. They'll be able to get the whole story of what of, and the meaning of the scripture. Scriptures, but that's not how the Bible is written. Let's go real quick to the book of Isaiah, chapter 28. And also the Bible is written in parables, which parables are pretty much... A riddle form, you know, it's parabolic. You know, sometimes when you read the scripture, sometimes it's straightforward. And sometimes it's in an allegorical sense, but it means something else. It may be written a certain way, but it means something else, you know. And the Lord has given us the teachers to be able to break those mysteries down. You know, to us, you know, and if the spirit is working with you, you see that. If not, then I don't know what to tell you. Uh, Isaiah 28 and 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Meaning the Most High is going to, this is a question. Who is the Lord going to teach knowledge and who is he going to make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Because when we all come into this thing at first, we, be, we come into this thing like babies. Sucking their mother's breasts to get what? That nutrition or those nourishments to be able to grow. So once a baby no longer has need of his mother's milk, that means the baby's weaned. So once a brother comes into this thing and they learn for a certain period of time, you know, the milk of the scriptures, then eventually it comes a point where they're ready for solid foods, so to speak, you know. So who is the Lord going to teach those that are drawn from the uh, those that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast? Now you're ready to go on unto perfection. Then it goes on to say, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So in other words, when you read these scriptures, the scriptures jump. You you may read something in Genesis, and a scripture in Isaiah will be a link up to it. Or a scripture in Matthew might be a link up to it. Or you may have to go to the book of Second Ezra in the Apocrypha, you know, to link up certain scriptures together. You know, also this is dealing with, you know, how the, the, the scriptures have taken Jake a little here and a little there. You know, but the Bible is a puzzle. And sometimes when you read a particular chapter, it doesn't follow in succession, you know. It jumps around in history, and such is the case with the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter, and we'll give you an example of that as we read through it. All right, so let's start off. Revelation 21, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. What does this mean? The bottomless pit is a representation of Europe. What is a bottomless pit, or what is bottomless? Meaning that there's no bottom to it. 
All right, so a bottomless pit would be something that has no bottom to it. So how do we know that this is actually speaking about lands and is not actually speaking about a place called hell as these people try to make you believe? Well, let's go to the book of Second Ezra's chapter 5 and verse 23. And it states, And said, O Lord, that bears rule of every wood of the earth, and of all the trees thereof, thou hast chosen thee only one vine. And of all lands, so what are we dealing with here? Lands. First we were dealing with trees and vines. Now we're dealing with what? Lands. And of all the and of all lands of the whole world, thou hast chosen thee what? One pit. And what is that one pit? That one pit is the land of Israel. That's the pit that the Lord... So lands are considered to be pits. But these pits, some of them are fruitful. I have uh, many different nutrients and resources in it. You know, different uh, minerals and, you know, uh, uh, where you could grow vegetation, spices, so on and so forth. And some of them don't. And it just so happens that in Europe, they have a lack of... Of mineral resources that's why they can't grow a lot of food there they have to outsource their food so to speak or not outsource they have to bring in their food from other sources like India and different other places you know the, the uh, islands and places that have that are fruitful in vegetation to be able to import into their uh, their particular country and that is the case with Europe, and that's why it's called a bottomless pit, because no matter how far down you dig, you're not going to find the, the nutrient-rich soil that you would if you went to places like India or Israel or, you know, around the uh, Bab so-called, you know, Babylon, Iraq, Iran, and those areas where they have rich soil in certain places. This is why the so-called scholars call that region... They call it the Fertile Crescent because that's where the world started to be repopulated again by Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japhet. All right, so the bottomless pit is Europe. So the key of the bottomless pit, the key is a representation of locking somebody up. It says the bottomless pit is Europe and a great chain in his hand and the great chain is a representation of slavery. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to hit this word bottomless pit because they try to say that this is the, you know, it's, it's from the Greek word abusos, is where you get the word abyss, right? And listen what they say, bottomless, unbounded, the abyss, the pit, the immeasurable depth, which all of this is correct. Now we get here of Orcus, a very deep gulf or chasm in the lowest parts of the earth, used as a common receptacle of the dead, and especially as the abode of demons, Right? Now, there was somewhere else that I read, right, here it says, uh, and, and of, uh, of deathless, an example, especially infernal. There's nothing in this word that implies anything to do with infernal. What is infernal? That means infernal or like to burn. There is nothing in this word itself that indicates anything of anything to do with fire, Okay. And now it comes from a compound word, abusos, or abyss, comes from a compound word of alpha and buthos. Now, what is alpha? Alpha is the very first letter of the Greek alphabet, first letter of Greek alphabet, okay? The beginning and the end. So alpha, or beginning, right? And then you have the other part of the root word, which is buthos. Now, what is buthos? The bottom or depth of the sea, the sea itself, the deep sea. So notice it has nothing to do with infernal, hot, fiery flames, none of that. But this is what they do. Now, another key here is what? Orcus. Now, who is Orcus? Orcus is a false god that uh, of the Romans where they so-called send the abode of the dead or the so-called, you know, uh, infernal region, so-called. And when we go here, I just typed in who was Orcus. Orcus, Latin Orcus, was a god of the underworld, punisher of broken oaths in Italic and Roman mythology. So it's a mythology 
that was what? That was linked in to the scriptures. And this is why you have that lie of hell being taught out there. But that's another topic for another lesson. If any brother wants to jump on that, they can jump on that and get down. You know, so we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. And we're going to deal with a great chain in his hand, which the great chain is a representation of slavery. Let's go to the word chain because the word great is megas and the word chain is halusis, halusis. A chain bound by which the body or any part of it, hands, feet, is bound. Now, when I look right here, uh, of uncertain derivation, a fetter or manacle. Fetters go on the feet, manacles go on the hand. Bonds, chain. So it's a representation of what? Slavery. So now let's go to a couple of precepts. Let's go to the book of Psalms. Chapter 2, verse 8. And it says, or reads, ask of me, and I shall give you the heathen for thine inheritance. So what does it mean to give you the heathen for your inheritance? It means to give them as servants. Because pursuant to the, to the law, we are supposed to take um, servants, slaves of the heathen, of the other nations. It says, in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, because we're going to inherit the nations are slaves, and we're going to inherit pretty much the world and many more things. That's just giving it a light uh, uh, understanding. Uh, that's another lesson. Now let's go from there to the book of Psalms, the 149th chapter and the 5th verse. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Who are the saints? The Israelites. You could go to the previous chapter to prove that. Let them. And what is the, what is the glory? The glory is the kingdom of heaven. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Why? Because when we get to the kingdom, we're going to be happy. You know, like today, you have these international banking families, these rich men of the world, that when they get up in the morning, they're happy because they have everything. But they have everything on, on the, uh, on the uh, 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 as a, a sleight of hand or as a fraud or oppression, and they're going to lose it all. And shout out to the, you know, the... Elders in Akim and Akwarth on, on the comic board. Shalom, uh, GMS Italia. Shalom, brother. It says, Let the high praises of the Most High be in their mouth, which is what? The Bible. And a two edged sword in their hand, which is what? A killing instrument. For what purpose? To execute vengeance, because there's going to be an execution of vengeance. And that's another topic. Upon the heathen, because it's not going to be upon the Israelites, it's going to be upon the heathen. Why? For what they've done. And punishments upon the people, because they have to pay. And this is their, their first destination after the destruction is what? Slavery. To bind their kings with chains, see? So who are their kings? Their leaders with chains. Put them in, that, in those chains. Now this scripture here, in Revelation chapter 20 was a time period where Satan or the adversary, which is not the spiritual demon Satan, but the physical counterpart, which are the Edomites, so-called white people, so you could understand, they were bound. There was a dark cloud put over them. They were in the region of Europe because that's where you had the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire. You know, they spread abroad. You, they took down a lot of Germanic tribes and they had all of those lands. So when they fell... They were in chains. Some of them were actual slaves. You know, some of them were just in a, in a position to where they couldn't get out of it. Just like we're under curses and we can't get out of it till the Lord frees us up and gets rid of that dark cloud. Well, they were under that dark, dark cloud for a certain period of time. So it says to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. And that is a representation of slavery, total subjugation. To execute upon them the judgment written, because we read about this all throughout the scriptures. He that leadeth into, ca into captivity shall go into captivity, and many others. This honor have all his saints praise ye the Lord. So this is an honor. 
to be able to put these nations into slaves into slavery. So any Israelite that doesn't want slaves, there's something wrong with their faculties. The mind faculty not right. <laughs> Inside joke. All right. Now, let's go back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20 and 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, meaning the angel, which I believe this angel is Yahweh Shai because it, it says that he has a key of the bottomless pit. When you go to the first chapter, the 18th verse, it speaks about Yahweh Shai having that key. I uh, says, and he laid hold on the dragon, which the dragon is the Roman Empire, and is also representation of the whole beast, you know, with the seven heads and ten horns. The whole, the whole thing is a representation of the seven major empires of Esau. Is also a representation of the uh, of NATO and the EU, you know, and everything that they have. That old serpent, which goes back to the Garden of Eden, because that same spirit that was in that man. That was in the garden that was called a serpent is the same spirit that's in that was in Cain and is the same spirit that was in Esau and is the same spirit that's in you Edomites or you so called white people today, which is the devil, which is a uh a slanderer, a deceiver, and Satan, which is what? The adversary. And this is why people don't understand because they take in this literally as it being the spiritual demon Satan, which is not, because the spiritual demon Satan is in total order with the most high and bound him a thousand years and this is a key date now like i said when we get when we get uh further down i'm going to show you how the time periods of that thousand years jumps and this is why if you don't understand that uh history you're going to get confused when you read this because it's going to sound like you know, once Satan is uh, or Esau is put into captivity, there's going to come a time where they're going to get out of it and then put us back in captivity. No, that's not going to happen. All right. So now let's deal with that. Let's go to dealing with the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. All right. Let's go from there to the book of Revelation chapter 12. And I believe that's verse 3, right? Yep. The red dragon, Satan. Which this is a representation of Esau's whole power structure. All of the kingdoms starting from the Greeks, the Romans, the French, the Spanish, Germania Major, Germania Minor, and uh, Great Britain. I believe that was all five. Let me see. The Greeks, the Romans, the French, the Spanish, Germania Major, Germania Minor, and the uh, British. That's it. That's their whole... The seven heads, the seven empires of the so-called white men that ruled beginning with the Greek empire. So when the Greeks came into power, which were the first Edomites to take control of the known world, that began the beginning of this great red dragon. All right. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, which shows you here that this is not dealing with the spiritual demon Satan. This was an actual beast that John saw in his vision, but that beast was a representation of different empires. And how do we know that? When we go to the same book of Revelation, chapter 17 and verse 9. It reads, And here is a mind which has wisdom. So now, the angel is going to break this down to the apostle John, which he still really didn't understand but this really was written down for us today so that we could understand what is meant by this great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and, and the crowns upon their uh, horns. It says the seven heads are seven mountains, which are which mountains in the scriptures is a representation of governments. You have the G, the G used to be the G8. They kicked Russia out. So now it's the G7, which is a meeting of top or major governments and what do they when they come together what do they call that they call that a summit now what is a summit what is a summit let's see what comes up a 
and that's called the G8 Summit, or, or now it's G7, Summit, the highest point of a hill or a mountain, a meeting between heads of government, and that's what a government is a representation of, which we read here in Revelation 17. And here is a mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And the woman, being America, she sits on, they, they're pretty much propping her up. That's why when you read up above, it says that the beast carried the woman. Because America is pretty much being carried by these European nations. And they're getting tired of carrying this hoe. All right? And there are seven kings, which lets you know that it's not talking about seven Mountains. There were seven kings, which are rulers. Five are fallen, because by the time when the Apostle John had this vision, you had the Greeks and the French, the Spanish. Uh, let me see, I'm sorry, the Greeks. Yeah, the Greeks, the French, the Spanish, Germanian Major and Germanian Minor that fell to who? They fell to the Roman Empire, which was in rulership at the time when John had this vision. And around this same time was when the last Edomite ruler of the Roman Empire died, which was uh, Vespasian, which he died around 96 AD. And this is around the time when the Apostle John had this vision. But the kingdom, even though Jake was ruling, starting with Nerva, the kingdom was still run under the Roman rule as far as their uh, legislation and all of that. It hadn't made a transition yet. Right? So in their seven kings, five are fallen, which you just mentioned them, and one is. So who was the one that was in this time? That was dealing with the Roman Empire. So that makes six. And the other is not yet come because the other one still hadn't really ruled yet, which was what? Uh, Great Britain. And when he cometh, meaning when he starts to rule, he must continue a short space. And they have continued a short space because when it's, from the time they started ruling... To the time America came into place and they took over, which America happens to be the eighth, they didn't really rule that long. Although behind the scenes, they're still uh, pulling the strings, so to speak. But on paper, you know, and to the world, they're not ruling anymore. All right? All right, so it says, And the beast that was and is not, that's dealing with America. When you read up above that, it says even he is the eighth because America is the eighth. Because remember, Daniel 7 speaks about that little horn that came out, which is a representation of America, that power. So America is the eighth and is of the seven. In other words, they came out of America, came out of that demonic union of those seven heads or those seven so-called European empires or Edomite European empires and goeth what? Into perdition because the reason why America was established was to push wickedness upon the earth and the Lord using America as an example when he destroys America. It says, and the ten horns, well, that, that's pretty much it. We don't need to read. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. Let's read, let's read that. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which lets you know that this beast, which this is breaking down, that the seven heads and ten horns, this beast that the Apostle John saw represented uh, rulers and their governments. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. See? And the beast is a representation of the whole, uh, um, the whole system. You know, you have America, you have NATO, you have the EU, you know. And all of them are, are riding off of the back of... Of all of those seven empires. Alright. America being the eighth today. Hope hope you brothers understand. Alright. Now let's go back. To Revelation chapter 20. And let's deal with the thousand years. So now when did this thousand years begin? This thousand years really began. I mean. The Roman Empire. With the Edomites really fell. In 96 A.D. Nerva, when Nerva came into power, which he was a Jake, that's when Jake started ruling. But remember, they were still ruling under Roman authority, under Roman uh, legislation. You know, so really, technically, when you move it up around 325 AD or so, 
this is really when um, there was a change from the Roman rule into what they call the so-called Holy Roman Empire. So you could kind of throw that in there as a date, even though Jake was already in rulership. And although uh, Constantine was a pagan, but he, he uh, so-called adopted Christianity with pagan worship, and it became the Holy Roman Empire. So roughly around that time period, that's when right the Byzantine Empire started to really come into fruition. But you still had the influence of Rome, you know, the Roman legislation and all that. All right. So from that time period until the um, until Esau came back into power, that's when that thousand years came to be. All right. So it says uh, so that was a thousand year period and the uh, Byzantine Empire, Dark Ages or when Esau fell, they fell around. Um, they fell around 96 AD, but really. When you go up further, like I said, during the time of um, um, Constantine, and when you type in when did the Renaissance begin, they say the 1300s. It's really more like the mid-1300s, which lines up with the thousand-year period from around the time of Constantine till the beginning of the Byzantine Empire. But they really started getting deep into it, into the Renaissance around the mid-1400s into the 1500s, okay? Yeah, that's right. The Renaissance rebirth, deadly wound was healed. That's right. That goes to Revelation 13. Yep, you got the Renaissance. Yep. All right, so going back, it says, So the Lord laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, which is dealing with Esau, and bound him a thousand years. So they put it, they put a, prison sentence on Esau for that time period and cast him into the bottomless pit because they were still in Europe and shut him up and set a seal upon him. So when he sealed upon, when they sealed him, he couldn't go anywhere. It's just like when somebody's thrown in prison, they can't go anywhere. You know, they're locked up and they got to wait until the, the, the um, date when they can be released. So that's what happened to Esau. That he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And that's what happened. They will loose that little season, which is what? The so-called Renaissance period. Now, which which we, we read here that the Renaissance started around 1300, but it really was around the mid-1300s. All right? So, this is the, this is the point in the chapter... Where it starts to jump. Because if you read into the next verse. You're going to think that this thousand years here. Is connected to this thousand years. And it's not. Because here it says after that he must be loosed a little season. So what we have to do is instead of reading on. We got to jump down to the seventh verse. Satan free doomed. Right here it says what? He must be loosed for a little season. Satan free doomed. See? So we read here, Revelation 27, and when the thousand years are expired, meaning this thousand years, that first thousand years, it says, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan or Esau shall be loosed out of his prison, meaning they're going to come out of that cloudy haze, so to speak, and those chains are going to be taken off them, and they're going to be able to take root, take root once again in the earth. But how... Is it that they took their root in the earth? Well, let's read on. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. So the very first thing they did was they deceived the nations which were in the four quarters of the earth. And how did they do that? Through the Renaissance period. And the brother from Italia, he put uh, the term iconoclasm. Which iconoclasm is a compound word. Icon which is image, and clasm, which is the defacing. All right? Here we go. The rejection or destruction of religious images as heretical, the doctrine of iconoclast, because how is it that you can be an Edomite, a so-called white man, right? And you're, you're proclaiming to be the new rulers of the earth, 
but every image that you see is a dark skinned image. The images of the Heavenly Father and His Son Yahweh Shai and the angels and the Israelites and the prophets were all brown skinned people. So, how can you rule having this as the paintings that you're supposed to represent? So, they had to take this, take it down and destroy it. That's why you have the term iconoclasm, the rejection or destruction of religious images as heretical, the doctrine of iconoclasts. Classes. So now, let's go back where we at. Um, let's go back. So we read that, we read that. Um, oh, yes. Came back. Now let's go from there to get a couple of these precepts here. Job chapter 13 and 4. It says, but you are forges of lies. So what does the word forges mean? When you forge something, it means you replicate it, but in a falsified way, for lack of better words. The word is to Paul, to smear, plaster over, stick, glue. Hey, sounds like a iconoclasm to me, you know? It says to impute falsely forge. Now, when we look up this word forge, the word forge definition it says make or shape a metal you or by heating so you can forge something by making it shaping it right so on and so forth uh create a relationship a new condition let's see if we could find another let's see what this says Right here, to make a forgery or counterfeit. This is what we're looking for. Forgery or counterfeit. The act of forging something, especially the unlawful act of counterfeiting a document or object for the purpose of fraud or deception. So we just read that you are forges of lies. You know, it says here to smear plaster over stick glue. Right, so, so let's go back. It says, um, but you are forges of lies, you are all physicians of no value. So that's what they are, they're forges of lies. Now let's go from there to the same book of Job 9.24, because how did they forge these lies? Job 9.24, it says, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. So the scripture saying that the earth is given in possession to the wicked. We read in the scriptures that the wicked are identified with the Edomites. Although you have wicked among all nations. But the nation of the Edomites are the wicked. So the earth has been given into their hands. So what did they do when the earth was given into their hand? He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. So what does it mean to cover the faces of the judges thereof? It means to plaster over. To smear to hide, to forge, to make a forgery, right? So we look at the word covereth. You have the word kasa, to cover, conceal, hide. So they hide, they hid something. What did they hide? It says the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the what? The faces of the judges thereof. Who is the top judge of everything? The Most High, Yahweh. How did he cover the most most high's face uh, as a judge thereof? By putting up his face, his forgery. You see? By him putting himself up as being the most high. You go to um you go to Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. It tells you how he sits in the temple of the most high, showing himself that he is the most high, that he's worshipped. You see? So this is a smear campaign that they had for that period of time known as the Renaissance, which the Renaissance re is back and the Sans is birth. The rebirth. The rebirth of who? Not the rebirth of Slick, uh, Diggable Planets, for those of you brothers that, that remember that group. It was dealing with the rebirth 
of Esau coming back out of that state of being uh, in captivity, uh, that dark cloud. And the very first thing he did was deceive the whole earth by paint, painting his images around the world as he's the Most High and he's Yahweh Shai, he's the angels and he's the Israelites and he's all these great men and kings and the great civilizations was all Edomites. When everything that they do, they steal from the other nations. They call themselves the Aryan race. The original Aryan race were the Elamites, the so-called uh, um, um, East Indians. Everything they got, they stole from somebody. You know, there's a there was a point, I don't know if it's going to come up, but there's something dealing with the Etruscans that they stole from the Etruscans and, and uh, incorporated into their, into their uh, everyday life. All of them different religious rites and all of that that they got and uh, uh, witchcraft and all that they stole that from from the other uh, from the dark nations. So they covered the faces of the judges thereof. If not, if they didn't do it, where and who is it? Who who did this? Okay, who did this? Who did this? Who did it? Who done it? What nation of people fits this bill? Who did this? When you go down the line, by process of elimination, the so-called white man did it. So they are the wicked. And the Bible identifies the Edomites as being the wicked. Now, let's go to Isaiah 25 and 7. And he, meaning the Most High, will destroy in this mountain, meaning in America, this government, because this is where the truth came from. The main problem that these uh, Christian apologetics like vocab and Dr. James White, the Edomite, you know, and all the rest of them devils have is what? With the so-called one westers, the Hebrew Israelites of one west. And he will destroy in this mountain, meaning the Most High is going to destructure in America the face of the covering cast over all people. So these lies that were cast over all people are going to be knocked down, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of the Most High. So that's what's happening here. So the prophets are out here tearing down these strongholds, these lies that these devils have put up. And that's what the book of Revelation 20 is about. It's about breaking down and showing you in history what took place, what happened, and how the Lord is turning everything right side up. It says, and the veil that is spread over all nations. So going back to Revelation chapter 20, right, we'll get... Uh, back to this this later, Lord's will, the Gog and Magog part, which is Russia. Uh, now that we read the first three verses and that thousand years, and we linked it up with the seventh and the eighth verse for the thousand years, that was a time from the ending of the Byzantine slash Dark Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance until this time now. All right? Now we, we do is we jump back in time. I'm sorry, we jump forward in time after... Esau does what he does, right? And this ver uh, verse 4 is talking about the kingdom of heaven. This thousand years is talking about in the kingdom of heaven. Totally different from the thousand years in the previous verse. Even though it seems like it's going uh, uh, lined up with, with the uh, third verse, it's not. Uh, Revelation 20 and 4, and I saw thrones. So this is what the apostle John saw. He saw actual Israelites ruling in the kingdom of heaven. And they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yahweh Shai, which are the men of the Lord, the prophets, the apostles, the, you know, the rest of the men, teachers, so on and so forth, and for the word of the Most High, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon his foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Yahweh Shai a thousand years. This is in the kingdom of heaven. A totally different thousand years than the previous verses. Alright, so let's go from there. Let's deal with um, the book of, let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Dealing with the thrones. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 27. And it said, and it reads, the disciples reward. See? Uh, Matthew 19, 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? So we gave everything up. So what are we going to receive in return? Right? 
It says, And Yahweh shall said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration or in the reincarnation, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, which is what? The kingdom of heaven, and the Israelites being joint heirs with the Lord, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is what this this uh, t uh, fourth verse is speaking about. That's what this uh, thousand year uh, period here is speaking about in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, and they were, and that's why the apostle John saw thrones. Now, let's go from there to the book of Psalms, chapter one twenty two, and verse five. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. So these. The house of David, the men that were with King David, they're going to be sitting on thrones in the kingdom of heaven. There's going to be a government, a governing body. All right. And that's going to be in the kingdom of heaven. So Revelation 20 and 4 is totally different than Revelation 1 to 3. This thousand year period here is different from this thousand year period here. This thousand year period was from the fall of the Roman Empire till the Renaissance period. And this thousand year period here in the fourth verse is dealing with the kingdom of heaven. Two totally different time periods. Now, let's go back. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. And it reads, And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, dealing with Yahweh Shai. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to Yahweh by thy blood out of Every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Because the, Israel, the Israelites are scattered among all nations. And that's why it speaks about uh, those nations being blessed. Because Israelites are there. And has made us unto our power, Yahweh, kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. Alright, so those this... Uh, Thousand year period here of the thrones what the Apostle John saw. This is dealing with in the kingdom of heaven. All right. Now, from this point, right, we'll jump to the very last part of verse uh, of uh, the fifth verse because this thousand years, I mean, it all goes together, but I just want to make the point. And they lived and reigned with a thousand years, right? This is the first resurrection in the kingdom of heaven. So the first thousand years is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death, which is the destruction, the nuclear missiles, hath no power. Why? Because they're sealed to be delivered to go into the kingdom of heaven, to sit on thrones through the first resurrection. But they shall be priests of the Most High and of Yahweh Shai. And in the fifth chapter, we read they're going to be kings also. And shall reign with him a thousand years. So these three verses here are all speaking about the kingdom of heaven. Salaki for a minute. All right, so like it brought that, brothers, I had to take that call. All right, so that is the two distinctions, you know, in the 1,000-year period. So now when we go back to the fifth verse, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the 1,000 years were finished, this is going to the period after the after we reign with Yahweh Shai 1,000 years and after these nations uh, go into captivity. That goes hand in hand. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing upon, loud upon their beds. And you read on down that the kings be put in chains and the uh, nobles in fetters of iron. That's going to be the first thousand years of the kingdom of heaven. After that thousand year period that the nations serve their captivity, 
then they're going to be able to be freer, so to speak. They'll still be tributary, but they'll be able to have their own lands, you know, and be able to govern among themselves, you know, somewhat have a little more freedom, so to speak, but they'll still be tributary to us. They'll still have to um, be governed by our laws, statutes, and commandments. All right. Now, a precept that goes good with that is in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, and verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beasts, which are the other nations, they had their dominion taken away because they were gonna, they're going to be taken away for a certain period of time, yet their lives were prolonged for a season in time. Why? Because they eventually the nations will have their own lands, be able to govern themselves and kind of come and go, you know, among themselves, but they'll still be tributary to us. They'll still be our servants and our slaves. The only ones that will not be around are the ones that are going to get Obadiah 118. All right, so you could go read that so you can understand what that means. You read Obadiah 118 and you'll understand what nation is not going to be around, you know, um, after that thousand year period? Because all nations for the first thousand years in the kingdom of heaven will be servants. They will be slaves, you know, outside of the nation of Israel. But after a thousand years, one particular nation is going to be Obadiah 118. And you can read about that and you find out who that nation is. He, he, he. <laughs> All right, so now let's go from there. Let's go back to Revelation uh, chapter 20. Now let's deal with the eighth verse, the middle of the eighth verse. But let's read the whole eighth verse again. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. That's dealing with Esau and his uh, whole demonic empire. It says Gog and Magog, which goes back to uh, Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39, which are the Russians. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, which is what? Armageddon. Har Magad one. Uh, Har is mountain. God is troop. And one at the end makes it uh, plural. Har Magad one. Uh, mountain of the troops. And that is that the uh, so called World War III that will um, be fought over there in the so called Middle East. Okay? And they went up on the breadth of the earth because the Russians will uh, have five-sixths of their armies out there. And only a sixth part or the, the one part of their uh, army is going to be left in Russia. The other five parts are going to go out to be destroyed. And compass the camp of the saints about, which is the land of Israel. The camp of the saints, not the saints themselves. And the beloved city, which is what? Jerusalem. And fire came down from the most high out of heaven and devoured them because there's going to be missiles. There's going to be lasers from the chariots. There's going to be actual fire that the Lord is going to issue, pelt down upon these devils when this destruction comes. It's going to be a devastating destruction, man. Uh, let's go from there to the book of Habakkuk chapter 3 to give you like a little... Just think of... Um, just think of... Sodom and Gomorrah. Read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, and you'll be able to get a visual of how the Lord caused fire to come down from heaven and destroy those cities. So this time is going to be in the form of the missiles and the lasers from the chariots. But the Lord could also cause fire to come down, you know, uh, um, as well. You know? Hey, because the Lord, when he gets loose, he ain't going to hold back. You know? That's going to be the day of fireworks, you know, fire and brimstone. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 3. It says, for this man was, uh, that's Hebrew, so like I typed in the wrong. That's Habakkuk, not Hebrew. It's Habakkuk 3 and 3. The Most High came from Teman. That's That was, uh, this is a, a um, I believe this is one of, this. actually this is, uh, is a representation of Esau. But you also have, because um, uh, they say that this is dealing with the Germans. But uh, you also have, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, this also represents Esau. Because I believe this goes back, the Temanites go back to the uh, sons of Japheth. You know, I would have to uh, um, go over there again. But I'm almost positive it goes back to the sons of Japheth. 
the actual, you know, Japhites, you know. But the Lord, it says, the Most High came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His uh, glory covered the heavens, which his glory is a representation of what? The chariots. And the earth was full of his praise because the whole world, the whole world is going to be filled with the knowledge of Yahweh Bashem Shai. So by the time the Lord comes, the whole world is going to know who it is that's, that's uh, getting busy. All right? It says, and his brightness was as the light because the chariots are going to be glowing with the lights. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his side, out of his hand, I'm sorry. And when you look in the um in um sorry, the uh red Bible that we have, it says um Salake. Let me get it. Oh, uh, it says bright beams. That's what it says. It says bright beams out of his side, which are what? Those lasers. And there was a hiding of his power. When we go to that word horn, right, it goes to the Hebrew word Quran. Horn, horn of strength, flask, uh, musical instrument, uh, horn from the from the uh, altar of rays of light. All right. So these, what are these rays of light? What is a ray of light? Concentrated heat. So the chariots are going to fire concentrated heat, which Esau calls what? Lasers. And that's what's going to come up out of these chariots. And his brightness was as the light from the lights of the chariot. He had horns coming out of his side, which are the lasers coming out and there was the hiding of his power because that's how he's coming to take uh, this devil down. Remember, Yahweh is coming, traveling in the uh, power of his strength. It says, he stood and measured uh, the earth and beheld uh, he stood and measured the earth he beheld and drove asunder the nations because that's what he's coming to do. And the everlasting mountains which are what? The different government Government, the higher governments, America, Russia, China, so on and so forth, were scattered. And the perpetual hills, which are the smaller uh, um, governments, he did bow. His ways are everlasting. Because the scriptures say that in that day alone, the Lord shall be exalted. The haughtiness of men shall be put down. down. All right? So that's showing you that the chariots are coming with uh, concentrated heat. So that's more fire. Yahweh Shai said, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? So going back to Revelation chapter 20 and 10, it says, And the devil, which is are the Edomites, their power structure, that deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So Esau's whole power structure is going to be taken down overnight by the Lord in one hour. It says, Where the beast and the false prophet are the beast, you and Nato, and also the different um, uh, heads of Esau and the false prophet are, which are the false prophet is dealing with the uh, Roman Catholic Church and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Right. So their smoke is going to go up for a long period of time. You know, that's what it means. They're going to be tormented day and night when it speaks about the worm eating them forever and the Smoke going up, descended forever. That's talking about for a very long time, generation after generation, because there's going to be a lot of fuel and fire that's going to destroy this place. Let's get real quick. Uh, Isaiah chapter nine and five. It says, "For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise." That's how the uh, battles were fought in the past. You know, with with uh, helmets and you know. Uh, breastplates and swords and spears and there was yelling you know and, and fighting you know going on it says and garments rolled in blood because you had a lot of blood going on on, on the battlefield and that was the, the way that they fought battles in the past today with the technology they have they don't fight battles like that anymore you know they fight battles by shooting missiles at each other it says but this meaning this battle shall be with burning and fuel of fire and there's another verse in here that speaks about, I believe it's the meat that's going to be the, the uh, fuel for that fire. And other, uh, uh, the elements, you know, such as cars and planes and trains and buildings and coal and natural gas, propane, so on and so forth. Alright, so now, Revelation 20, 11, Judgment at the throne of the Most High. And I saw a great white throne, which is the throne of the Lord, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Why? Because the new heaven is coming. Which is the new heaven and the new earth is the same heaven and the same earth refreshed 
in righteousness. So wickedness is going to pass and righteousness is going to rule. And there was found no place for them. Yeah, because these nations will never ever rule again. You know? So our kingdom, which is Yahweh Shai's kingdom, we join heirs with him, is going to be an everlasting kingdom which shall not be let out to other people. And I saw the dead, small, and great stand before the Most High, and the books were open. It's not talking about actual books. It's talking about the judgments that are coming, that are written in the book. And another book was open, which is the Book of Life, which is the same book, but it's the elect being delivered. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. So in other words, when the kingdom uh, is about to be established and the, and the judgment is coming, those that are to be saved will be delivered and those that are to be de destroyed shall be destroyed. And this is all written in the same book, which is the Bible. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it because you have actual people that died in the seas and they're going to come out, out of them, those seas. It says, and death and hell were delivered up uh, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. That's dealing with death, people that are actually dead. Some people that are dead that haven't even been put into the grave yet. And people that are already in the grave coming out of the graves. It's going to be it's going to be something, man. It says, and they were judged every man according to their works. You're right. Those that are to be delivered will be delivered. Those that are to be put to death will be put to death. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which shows you that hell is not the lake of fire. This is the second death, which is what? The nuclear missiles. You know, you, you could throw all the, everything else in there, but the main thing is what? The nuclear missiles. That's that lake of fire. And then the lasers from the chariots and everything else is going to just uh, add to the mix. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Meaning, if you're not part of the elect and you're here in America, guess what? Your destiny is to be bathed in that lake of fire. All right? So pretty much with that, that's been the book of Revelation chapter 20. Uh, I pray that it was edifying. I pray that your brothers were edified. And to the next time I say, Shalom.